Dubai, the United Nations has issued a new warning about the sheer pace and scale of climate change. The UN's climate body warned that this year's global temperature is already 1.4 degrees above the pre-industrial average and 2023 is set to be the hottest year ever. Remember, the Paris summit in 2015 committed to keeping the temperature rise below 2 degrees. Opening COP28, its president, Sultan al Jaber urged countries to live up to their commitments. But there's huge controversy about whether phasing out fossil fuels will be part of any agreement. The BBC's climate editor, Justin Rowlett, is in Dubai and has sent this report. A petrostate hosting a climate conference sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. But the president of COP28, who is also the head of the UAE's huge state oil company, says he knows the world has to change and is taking action. Hearing no objections, it is so decided. The cheers are because the conference has agreed to create a fund to pay for the loss and damage climate change is already wreaking on poorer countries. This whole area was destroyed. It has been a bone of contention between the developed and developing world for decades. It is great that we got it adopted here at the start. It's been over 30 years in the making uh, and it's time now to get the job done and so that we can get money into the, the areas affected by the harms of climate change. More than £300 million has already been promised for the fund, including £60 million from the UK. So what else is on the agenda? Here are the three most contentious issues on the table. First up, cutting carbon. Will countries be persuaded to include food and agriculture, a third of all emissions, in their carbon cutting targets? Second up, cash for developing countries. The rich world caused the climate crisis, burning fossil fuels. Poorer countries say now you've got to pay to solve the problem. And finally, the future of fossil fuels. Will the conference agree to phase down or maybe even phase out fossil fuels? At the moment, the only commitment the world has made is to phase down coal. It has been an eventful start here in Dubai and it is only day one. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has charted a clear path to the 1.5 degree world. But we need leadership, cooperation and political will for action and we need it now. And I urge countries to speed up their net zero timelines to get there as close as possible to 2040 in developed countries and 2050 in emerging economies. Second, we cannot save a burning planet near fire holes of fossil fuels. We must accelerate a just, equitable transition to renewables. So King Charles also addressed the summit today. He said the world needs transformative action to handle a crisis that is already impacting countless lives. It's an important message, giving, uh, given the World Meteorological Association now says 2023 has been Earth's hottest year on record. Here's what King Charles had to say about the impacts of that intense warming. The dangers are no longer distant risks. I have seen across the Commonwealth and beyond countless communities which are unable to withstand repeated shocks whose lives and livelihoods are laid waste by climate change. And you know, this year's COP started on a successful note. 200 nations came to an agreement on how to run the historic loss and damage fund. This fund is going to help developing countries pay for the rising costs of extreme weather that's all linked to the climate crisis. Now, the fund will be managed by the World Bank. Wealthier countries will deposit their contributions on a volunteer basis, but already six countries have pledged more than $550 million to the fund. Yeah, there's an uh, elephant in the room here mm -hmm. at this year's summit because this planet-focused conference is being led by... Well, turning now to the UN Climate Summit in Dubai, where world leaders agreed a major declaration on the future of farming and food supplies. It's the first time the annual UN gathering has recognized that what people grow and eat is a crucial factor in global warming. An agreement was signed by 134 countries, including the US, China and Brazil, who together represent 70% of the world's food production. They've each promised to take into account greenhouse gas emissions from the food and agriculture sectors in their national plans to combat climate change. 
In 2015, farming accounted for a third of our global emissions, with 18 billion tonnes of greenhouse gases emitted. Farming groups have welcomed the declaration, but warned that countries must deliver on their promises. Well, I'm joined now by Vanessa Kerry. She's the World Health Organization Director General's Special Envoy for Climate Change and Health. Vanessa Kerry, thanks indeed for joining us. The impact of climate change on health, those impacts are wide ranging from short term emergency to some longer term effects. Can you tell us what you're most concerned about? Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me uh, this evening. I'm concerned because the climate crisis is without question a health crisis, and I think it is deeply underestimated by many people around the world. Already in a new study just came out a few days ago that indicates that over 8 million deaths a year are from climate are from air pollution specifically. And of those 8 million, 5 million are from directly from fossil fuel use. Those numbers are much higher than we had originally estimated. We know that health impacts us in every, our health is being impacted by climate change in every possible way. If you just look at what happened in Libya, a storm that was created by climate change swept 20,000 people out to sea and killed them immediately. It impacts our cardiovascular health, vector-borne diseases like malaria. We're seeing it impact our access to food and agriculture, as you spoke about, which affects our nutrition. We're seeing it in terms of how it impacts our mental health. So we are being impacted by climate change and, and our well-being is being threatened every single day. Who is most at risk, Vanessa? Well, I think we've seen this throughout COVID. We've learned this lesson well, but we know that those that are most at risk by the impacts of climate change are those that are already the most vulnerable, who contribute the least to fossil fuel use and yet feel the brunt of it the most. And I think that is going to be one of the areas that we absolutely have to step up as a global community, which is to make sure that we're helping those communities be able to adapt to the changes that are already happening every day, but also to abate the and, and to phase out from fossil fuels that are causing this harm that are creating that kind of damage everywhere. So are you looking for a specific agreement to come out of COP28 that could make a very quick difference? I think without question on the table here, one of the things that did happen, which is terrific, is that there has been the announcement of the loss and damages fund that has already been funded um, ambitiously by a few countries. And we need to continue to fund that and to make sure that there's resources available for communities to be able to uh, invest in their adaptation and, and, to, and to be able to build their resilience to what's happening and to have stronger health systems to meet this moment. But we do also need to see much more meaningful progress on phasing out from fossil fuels. And I think that's going to be the big debate at this COP. Is it a phase out? Is it a phase down? Is it abated fossil fuels? Is it unabated? What are we talking about? But the reality is, as we know, is that fossil fuels are driving the harm that we see. And we have to make a meaningful phase out from fossil fuels. We also need to see an increased understanding of how much we are being impacted by climate change and the need to actually really address the health impacts of climate change, because without question, it isn't just our health that gets impacted, it's our country's GDP. It's a question about whether or not a household lives above or below the poverty line as a family can actually go to work or is forced to stay home from excess heat and they lose their wages. It's a question of migration and security with 1.2 billion climate migrants on the table. So we're talking about every single sector being impacted um, and uh, by the health impacts of climate change. And that's something that we need to understand and address much more aggressively. And we need to increase the financing available much more meaningfully and make sure it moves quickly into the communities that need it. OK, Vanessa Carey, World Health Organization, excuse me, Director General, Special Envoy for Climate Change and Health. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And remember, you can find about more about all the day's news at our website, bbc.com slash news and on your favorite social media platforms as well. I'm Katrina Perry. Thank you for watching World News America and do take care. Bye bye. Dr. Sultan Al Jaber, Jaber, who leads Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. Now, it has critics wondering just how much progress can be made on reducing the world's use of fossil fuels. Pattern climate science producer Ali Van Fleet explains the dilemma. You know that saying about the fox and the hen house? Well, some are concerned that's what's happening at this year's COP28. COP 
aka Conference of the Parties, is an international climate summit where nearly 200 countries meet up to hash out and negotiate efforts to fight global warming. Now, people linked to the fossil fuel industry have been attending these meetings since the annual climate negotiations began in 1995. In fact, at COP27 last year, oil and gas lobbyists outnumbered most delegations, which makes sense from a business perspective, considering any agreements made at COP could impact their bottom line, but it's difficult to quantify their influence at these summits because much of the negotiations happen behind closed doors. And it is worth noting, these climate talks have yet to produce any agreement to phase out or even phase down all fossil fuels. And this year in particular is raising questions about how cozy the industry is with these climate negotiations. Let's discuss. At the moment, we are currently on track for around three degrees Celsius of warming with our Paris Agreement pledges. And scientists say we have a little over a decade to move away from fossil fuels if we want to keep warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So COP28 could be our last chance to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. But let's take a closer look at why this year's talks appear to be more controversial than previous ones. The COPs are hosted in a different city each year. This time around, they're being held in Dubai and hosted by the oil-rich United Arab Emirates. And they chose a national oil executive, Dr. Sultan Ahmed al Jaber, to preside over this year's summit. And if you think that sounds like a conflict of interest, you're not alone. This will be the first time that a CEO, let alone one from the fossil fuel industry, has been appointed COP president. And while he's talking the talk, the phase down of fossil fuels is inevitable. In fact, it is essential and it must go hand in hand with the rapid phase up of zero carbon alternatives. But but some worry those zero carbon alternatives may include things like carbon capture technologies, which critics argue is wildly expensive and yet to be scaled up. And the real answer, experts say, is getting off fossil fuels completely. Meanwhile, the host country is reportedly using COP28 to make new oil and gas deals around the world, according to new leaked documents obtained by the Center for Climate Reporting and the BBC. Deepening concerns, this COP will see more fossil fuel influence than in years prior. These allegations are false, not true, incorrect, and not accurate. And it's an attempt to undermine the work of the COP28 presidency. For the first time ever, a significant number of oil and gas companies now aligned around net zero by 2050 targets and net zero 2030 methane emission targets. At COP28, we need a clear and credible commitment to phase out fossil fuels on a time frame that aligns with the 1.5 degree limit. The oil and gas industry argues that they need to be present at these talks because they're going to play a role in the transition to renewable energy. However, an IEA analysis revealed that oil and gas companies currently account for just 1% of clean energy investment globally. And 60% of that comes from just four companies. One thing that will be different at this year's COP28 is representatives of polluting industries will have to identify themselves as such when they register. But will that impact their influence? on the climate summit time will tell so there's a lot going on and it's time now for facts are facts for the first time cop 28 features an opportunity for countries to take accountability for their climate progress it's called the global stock take and it's a requirement outlined by the paris agreement it's so important here's a look at how it all works the global stock take is a review coming out of um, the, uh, the, the Paris Agreement in 2015, what progress has been made, what progress is yet to be made, where those gaps are, but also what is working and how that could be used to fill some of those, um, those gaps. But as well as taking stock, what is more critical is how do countries respond to, um, to that stock take, to those deficiencies, and the opportunities that presented um, in terms of um, shared knowledge, shared experience um, to fill those, those gaps. 
we're nowhere near where we need to be. And as we see weather report after weather report, news report after news report, disaster after disaster, we're seeing the impacts of climate change. Um, we're seeing the impacts, whether it's on communities, lives, livelihoods, literally on a daily basis now. So the need and the call for additional action, it's not only timely, it's urgent. So that's how the stockade is supposed to work, but what will the takeaways be from the process over the next, let's say, 11 days? Yeah. So Steph Abrams caught up with Jim Ski from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to learn more. Mr. Ski, thank you for joining us. What do you expect from the global stock take? Well, the, I mean, this is a global. This is a process that's been running for about eighteen months now, in which uh, you, your representatives of governments have been reviewing the progress that has been made over over the last five years or so. So, what I think is very clear. Uh, that's coming out of the technical phase of this dialogue is that everybody is following well short of the objectives of the Paris Agreement in terms of achievement. And that applies to reducing emissions, it applies to adaptation to the climate change that is inevitable, and it also applies to the levels of financing that, that have been applied. So I think it's a fairly unambiguous set of conclusions. The question is, what happens next? Let's talk a little bit more about that. Do you think it is feasible for us to keep global temperatures below two degrees Celsius? Well, I think it's certainly possible to keep uh, global warming uh, below two degrees. And I think that, that possibility you, you, is still a very solid one. Where it gets more marginal is the question of the 1.5 degrees warming that is mentioned in the Paris Agreement uh, as something that we should be pursuing efforts towards. Now, that is just possible, but it is only possible if governments collectively take enough action to reduce emissions and bring them down by quite substantial amounts, something like by about 50% by the end of this decade. So if they, if they were able to do that, it is, it is still possible. But really, uh, uh, with, with all the delays in action, that possibility is slipping away from us. Yeah, because it's going to take a lot of work for a lot of people to do that. Now, earlier this year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change released the six assessment report. So how will these findings from the IPCC report help inform talks at COP28? Well, well what, what, what is happening? They, they've already uh, fed in already. As I said, the global stock take is a, actually a process that will end within the next two weeks, but it's been running for about 18 months. And the, the reports of IPCC have already been feeding into that global stock take alongside other scientific uh, inputs as well. So IPCC has played a significant role. I have to say the report that came out earlier this year, that was really the culmination culmination of seven, seven years' work. That was probably slightly too late to add significantly to the global stock take, but the reports that it was summarizing for sure have played a role in, in the, that technical assessment. All right, so of all the issues then that are being tackled at COP, which solutions do you think hold the most potential? Well, I mean, we've been very clear in the IPCC reports that in terms of reducing emissions, there are a lot of big opportunities right in front of us that could be deployed now. And the biggest example is probably in the energy sector, the, reduce, the use of renewable energy, which is expanding very quickly in several parts, parts of the world. Uh, there are quick wins to be got on reducing methanes, which can leak from fossil fuel systems. Methane is a very powerful greenhouse gas. And taking it out of the energy sector, there are also issues around land-related measures, for example, avoiding deforestation, reforestation, some changes in agricultural practices could all make a difference. There is no one silver bullet. We need to deploy many solutions to put ourselves on the right track. We really appreciate that. Um, Jim Ski, chair of the IPCC, thank you so much for joining us today and hopefully We'll get some more done after this uh, COP that we're having. I hope so. Thank you very much. Well, we all hope so. Well, it yeah. seems like this year we've already kind of 
started walking the walk, so to speak. Yeah. Last year was talk the talk, now we're actually making movement. I think one of the, the fabulous things is there are so many options and so many things that we can do to move in the right direction. And I love having shows like this that actually kind of break it down because there's so much going on.